So let us continue our discussion of political philosophy <coughs> with uh, Thomas Aquinas, or Thomas from Aquino, uh, place in Italy, one of the giants of medieval political thought, who has shaped our understanding of the relationship between reason and faith, of law, and so on. Aquinas born in 1224, very early on in his life, uh, so you know, 800 years after Augustine, which is um, quite surprising, we kind of tend to put everyone who lived before us in the same box, and well, Augustine Aquinas, well, 800 years to pick them. <coughs> so uh, Aquinas lived at the height of the Middle Ages, in, born in 1224, and at a very young age, very young age, he decided that he has a vocation for monastic uh, life, and he was very adamant about this. But this was a problem, this was a scandal, because his family was very rich, and traditionally the oldest son, uh, Thomas was the oldest son, would follow in the footsteps of the father, take over the business, or at least if he enters the clergy or the monastery, he would aim for some high positions, and that's not what Thomas wanted, he wanted to join the Dominicans, which was a new order, which were bound by an absolute vow of poverty. Well, his family was mightily unhappy with such an idea. But he was very stubborn and adamant about it. And, uh, well, they used all kinds of means to dissuade him, including locking him in a tower, sending uh, some women of ill repute to seduce him. And the uh, funny story goes that um, Thomas, who was kind of a, you know, uh, calm fellow, kind of an overweight, calm, you know, uh, fellow, uh, famously overweight, he, there's one time when he did lose his patience, and that was then, uh, and he threw a chair at them or such. So, uh, <coughs> eventually, uh, they can convince him, so eventually he joins the Dominicans, where he is uh, mocked mostly when while he's doing his studies by his peers because he was kind of a silent guy, overweight, you know, kind of in the back of the room. So they called him the dumb ox, the dumb ox. Well, the dumb ox turned out to be one of the, the greatest mind of, of the Middle Ages, as it usually goes, um, you know, to their shame. <coughs> Uh, Aquinas lived, and he was part of uh, a moment when Western civilization recovered Aristotle. Plato has always been around to the Neoplatonists, so not the original texts, remember. The original texts were, um, if not lost, but not uh, very uh, present in the general culture, neither from Plato nor for even less for, from Aristotle. And Aristotle is recovered. Um, in the Middle Ages, in the High Middle Ages, and you all know now something about Aristotle, that he was, all his constructs were based on observation, all his observations um, um, and constructs were based on reason. So, uh, within the church, which was the intellectual atmosphere of the day, right, um, this, this uh, bringing in of Aristotle um, raised some questions, what is the place of a non-Christian, completely, you know, was someone who wrote and worked before Christianity, what is the place within our frame of thought? But Augustine, uh, Aquinas, sorry, Thomas Aquinas had no problem, no qualm in embracing Aristotle and <coughs> literally bringing him in wholesale. There are obviously problems, there are intentions, if you read more, but overall it makes sense. And the reason why it makes sense, as you'll see, is that one of the key uh, issues in, in Aquinas, unlike in Augustine, is um, the emphasis that Aquinas puts on the good of reason, of the rational part of the human being. And on the fact that reason and faith, and this is a common place, by the way, the tradition of uh, Western Christianity, reason and faith cannot be opposite. I mean, it's, uh, it's absurd, and you see why. 
Uh, it is much later, and after Reformation, and uh, even much, much later in the 19th century, that uh, some will posit this as a, as a contradiction. But it never was. Not in the Middle Ages, and not, not even later. It's just there are other phenomena that happen, and there are other tensions. But reason and faith, not only are, uh, not only are they compatible, but they enrich each other. They enrich each other. They're just, let's put them um, this way, they are two ways, two different ways, complementary ways uh, of knowing. And we'll see how, how this works. Another important thing is to remember that we're, we're talking within the frame of Christianity, right? <coughs> and here, just like in Augustine, the question remains how to live in this world when the destiny of the human being is otherworldly, in the sense of your ultimate goal is not a perfect society here, right? City of God versus earthly city versus city of Babylon and Augustine. Augustine, whom Thomas Aquinas knew very well, read him. So uh, the human being has then two goals, uh, two ends. One that is within this world, which is life in the society with all that comes with that, and one that is eternal. Right? The eternal goal of man, which is God in, in the way. So, as you see, we are talking about uh, what is the human being, what is the best life, right? And <coughs> how should we live together? The same questions. Um, and since we are talking about goals and ends, this should bring up to you, this should uh, recall to you the principle of teleology, which, yes, of course, you will find in Aquinas, just like we saw it in Aristotle. Me meaning what? Teleology, not the theology, two different things. Teleology meaning that everything has a nature, and accordingly it has a natural end. Right? A seed of a poplar tree will, uh, the, the natural end of the seed, meaning the seed that accords with its nature, right? is to become a popular. Right? <coughs> so thus, all things have a natural end. But so also to the, with the human being. But what is the human being? Well, already we talked about the fact that it has a, he has two ends, and one is, which is this world, a real time, within history, life in society, so to speak, and one other world. And in fact, Aquinas is, Thomas Aquinas' choosing of the monastic path was by no way of a renegation uh, he was not remaining, he was not uh, <coughs> lowering the status of, of you know, married life and so on. That wasn't, it was simply, according to uh, his vocation, was <coughs> to live the ultimate end of man, of the human being, within this world. That's the essence of the monastic vocation. It's not the dismissal of this worldly life. This is why Aquinas insists that the human being well, is many things, right? Just like in uh, Aristotle, a uh, human being is a social animal, is a social being, needs society to be a human being, not just because we we'll get bored. <coughs> a human being is also a rational being, so reason, the exercise of reason, belongs to his her nature, right? Um, so, human being is biological, it has, he or uh, she has biological um, uh, mechanisms, needs, right? In the sense that, for example, um, the body requires that we feed ourselves, that we um, nourish ourselves with food, with water, and so on. Just like in Aristotle, right, the human being will have several ends that li differ, right? One, remember we talked about the fact that there is a rational part and then there is an irra irrational part, Here's the biological dimension, right? Well, here you have hunger, thirst, even the sexual drive, right? It's part of what human beings are, right? However, these are, uh, these are the biological things, and they all have their place within the, the life of the human being. <coughs> However, they, have, they can be used or abused, they can take over and so on, just like in Plato, right? when the desires, the appetites, drive contrary to reason. Well, the one that should drive the human being is reason, but, and that's Aristotle, right? 
In Thomas Aquinas, remember though, that there is reason and there is also faith. And faith is just another way of knowing that goes beyond what reason simply can give us. Or in other words, let's, we can also um, uh, talk about this in terms of reason and revelation. Revelation being that knowledge that is granted to the human being and goes beyond what the limits of reason would attain to. They're not contradictory. They're not contradictory. They're just <coughs> two ways of knowing. So revelation from God, right? For example, the scriptures. Tell, tell the human being things that he or she could not attain completely with reason. And we'll see how it goes. It's going to become clearer in a second. The point is that the human being has his, uh, the human being's na uh, goals, ends rather, right? There's a this worldly end and there's an other worldly end. And they all really fit him, fit the human being according to the nature of the human being. All the others, the irrational, all the other parts, everything that we have, right? As we are made, as we are constituted, according to Aquinas, uh, point towards a natural end that is good. And why is it good? Because, well, who made the human being the way the human being is? God, right? So, and since God is the origin of all good and the end of all good, <coughs> then the way we are is made well. It's made well, however, just like in Augustine, we are broken. Reason is broken, these instincts are broken, so instead of just feeding ourselves, we tell them to engorge ourselves. We tend to, to have, uh, to, to drink, and instead of just drinking, we drink too much, for example, right? So there's, that's what Aristotle referred to as virtue versus excess or deficiency, right? Or maybe, you know, we suffer from bulimia, or anorexia, right? Those are what? Those are the excesses or deficiencies from the right way, the right way, which is what? To eat as much as we need, right? So, all these instincts, it's not like, oh, now, basically, we just have to satisfy our instincts. It's not. That will be irrational. That will be according to a human being governed by the highest part. You know, Plato would agree, Aristotle would agree. So, we have, we, this, the way we are made, we're structured is good, and remember from Augustine, being is good, evil is sort of a parasite on being, on the good, trying to deform it, right? So it pushes, just like in Aristotle, it pushes the seed to, or a cell, think of a cell that has to become an organism, say, it develops from a cell to multiply versus the heart of the human being, right? Well, we all know that when cells grow too much, that's, that's cancer, right? And disorderly. And when they don't grow, that's another deform that's another lack, that's another uh, problem. So, excess, deficiency, the right way, which is the virtuous way. The same with, the same with everything that we are. Right? So, uh, that, that shows you, this shows you that Aquinas' view of the human being is, is familiar already for you from Plato, from Aristotle and so on. Teleology, the social nature of human being, the rational, the fact that it's a <coughs> the human being is a rational animal are also essential. But if this was perhaps a little bit too much or confusing, I think that the next part will clarify a lot of how what the framework is because we're going to talk about how this makes sense, right? Well, one of the things that and Aquinas wasn't a political scientist or a philosopher, uh, you know, first and foremost. He was a thinker, he was a theologian, he was a philosopher in pursuit of the truth, a lover of wisdom. And just like in uh, Aristotle or Plato, like big, great thinkers, politics, meaning how to live together in society, is one of the areas that you can't escape when you ask about truth, meaning, and so on. So, the political answers that <coughs> uh, Aquinas will give are just part of this inquiry into what is the position of the human being within the world, right? The same tension that he talked about between order and disorder, between meaning and lack of meaning, good and evil, and so on. So, one of the issues, and there are many aspects which 
which I will not actually deal with, for example, the just war theory that we talked about, remember the Iraq war, well, uh, Aquinas actually is one of the originators of, well, not the originators, but one who worked in detail on this idea of just war, just like Augustine did. But we don't have time, obviously, because this is just an introduction. But you can read into about this in Augustine and Aquinas. So just war theory, uh, theory of kingship, these are all aspects that he dealt with. But what I'm going to focus on today is his discussion on law. And your book does cover this aspect, the different types of law. And why is this important? Well, after World War II, after Nazi Germany, the Holocaust and everything, you all know that there was a famous trial in Nuremberg, Germany, of the foremost Nazi leaders. Right? So <coughs> they were caught, right? And the Holocaust was being discovered, and not just the Holocaust, all the crimes that they have committed. But the problem became, we're going to set up a trial, but how are we going to try that? More exactly, why? Or based on what? You're going to ask, well, they committed crimes. But what is a crime? A crime is when you break a law. And here's the question, what, which law did they break? But well, guess what? Everything those Nazi leaders did, or a lot of it, right, was legal. It was legal in the sense that it, uh, it was in accordance with German laws. So you're going to say, or you can say, well, yeah, yeah, the German laws were wrong. Who says that? I mean, based on what? The reason why this was a question which <coughs> was raised right then is that before World War One and around that time, one of the major theories of law, or philosophy of law, in terms of the origin of law, is what is law and what isn't law, was legal positivism. Meaning, positivism means that law is what the government decrees. So law is what the government decrees. Because, you know, this is modernity, right? Things have changed. There is no source for law in modernity, right? There are modern states, nation states, centralized states, whatever you want to call them, and the government governs a territory with sovereignty, especially up to World War II, before the UN and such, before international law in a way, in a way, in a way. <coughs> so the government of each territory being sovereign passes a law, that is the law. There is no abstract universal source of law that you could make reference to, or uh, based on which you could refuse the law. Right? What is the source of law? What is the basis of law? That you could actually enforce. Right? What? And that was the situation in which they found themselves. But after World War II. There at Nuremberg, you have these people who have orchestrated the mass killing of millions of, of other human beings. And there's no legal basis to judge them. Furthermore, there was no concept on which to base them because that crime that they committed didn't really have a name. The Holocaust, the genocide name actually was invented then for this. It means genos, um, genocide means from genos, means killing of a group of a national group. Genocide. A common side, the killing of a man. man. <coughs> So there was no there was no there was no point of reference. And this is when they again threw away the whole discussion of positivism, of the fact that law is what the government says it's law, and made reference to something called natural law. That there is an order. What does natural law say? Natural law implies that there is an order of things which we discover and which we enforce. That is not random, that is not arbitrary, that we live within it. But this is, what is this? This is the order that we talked about, the system of meaning. Right? This, it, by the 20th century, and this is why now the fascist, fascist regime, Nazi regime was possible in a way, we have lost this idea, or we have undermined this idea that there is a framework of reference. However, you can't escape it, because anything you say, any sentence that you say, any statement, in fact, is a statement of meaning, is a statement of truth. You're saying, this is how things are. Right? 
unless there is such a thing as, unless you can be right or wrong, words are meaningless. Words are meaningless. And there is no support for anything. And obviously no, none of us can live like that, right? So, so why am I bringing this up? Because natural law really in many ways starts for us, or uh, one of the major points of reference is this, is Thomas Aquinas. So according to Thomas Aquinas, to describe it, there are four types of law. And by law, we have to uh, understand exactly that order of the whole that we discussed, right? Which Plato was per, per, um, uh, seeking, Aristotle, Augustine, and so on. And even to see this, right? Pay attention to the fact that in the Melian dialogue, when the, when the Athenians tell the Melians, well, this is how things are. The gods act the same way. They're making a statement of order. They're making a statement saying that there is no order, that there is disorder, or rather that or the order of the world is in itself disorder. And this is how they justify their, their acts. So according to Aquinas, everything there is, and remember, this is within the Christian framework. Watch the um, Augustine lecture to get a closer, uh, to refresh your, your memory. So uh, this is everything there is, everything that is created. Things that we don't even know about, <coughs> things visible and invisible, for example, you know, the discoveries in biology or physics in particles that we don't even know about, or 100 years ago, to viruses, bacteria, we didn't know about them, right? But they exist. So everything that there is here in the cosmos, everywhere, right? But <coughs> everything is created, right? Part of creation, created by God. God. So everything there is, is has an order. And again, that applies to physics, chemistry, mathematics, all the relationships that make this world, you know, fit, uh, be together. The fact that between atoms and uh, particles, there are uh, uh, relationships that keep them together, which makes for us being physical human beings. You know, we live in a world of connections. Um, so I think there is all this order is, but of things visible and invisible, spiritual and physical, uh, ethical and biological, everything has an order. And what is this order? and this includes the angels and everything, it is the order that comes from God, from the Creator. And this, Aquinas called eternal law. Meaning, why eternal? Because this is the law created by God, and it's in accordance with His wisdom, His mind, so to speak. It's a very inappropriate way of describing it. Uh, Aquinas is much care more careful with words, but I'm trying to explain it. The order of the whole is a reflection of its creator, right? Because that's who cre made, uh, uh, made it be, uh, be, created it, right? Brought it into existence, but also maintains it into existence. God maintains everything there is in, in this order, into a, a relationship in existence and in the specific order. So this is eternal law. Now obviously we, human beings, don't have access to everything. We don't have the mind of God. Right? But can we know this order? And this is the important part. This is why the reason faith thing is, is so crucial. Because according to <coughs> Aquinas, and not only to him, but he really uh, describes this, yes, reason is that organ that God created with which we can know this part of this order of the whole. So, so under, I can draw it like this, this is all that a human being, the, with his reason, or her reason, right? This is, what, how, this is all the things that we can know from the order of the whole. And this is what the crime is called natural law. This is natural law. Natural law being those things that we know by virtue of being human. So not everything just through, through reason. For example, you know, th these include things so basic as having um, the, the knowledge that is in us that 
uh, you have to act towards what's good and not towards what's bad. No matter how you define good, right? We talked about the fact before that everybody acts towards the good, even if he is or she is wrong about what that good is, right? But this idea of choosing good instead of of, of, uh, of evil, the principle of survival or of maintaining existence, things very basic things such as a whole is greater than the parts, right? That we have this logical concept of uh, of difference, right? Between and of, of the, uh, we understand this logical uh, distinction between this and this, right? Big rock, small rock, the whole and the part. We have the knowledge. We, we, we it's inscribed in us, right? That this is distinct, and there is a relationship, right? And other essential things that are inscribed in us. So these are, these are sort of first principles of natural law. Things that on which we build our every other knowledge. And Plato somehow talked about them, if you remember. So, once again, one is natural law, it's not a different law, and law, the word don't, don't let it mis mislead.